I'm the chief data scientist for this. Uh, 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 so the meetup is also called Data Science Dojo, but we have a company called Data Science Dojo as well. Uh, so I'm the chief data scientist for that company. Um, we started around uh, uh, almost three years ago. Uh, my own background actually is I've been working in this space for more than a decade now. Uh, I have worked in, um, um, in bot detection, machine learning, online ads relevance, uh, online experimentation, A-B testing. So uh, I've been doing this for, for some time. Uh, my uh, background, uh, uh, prior to joining industry, uh, I have a PhD in computer science, and my focus was computer vision and data mining. And really, uh, the, this, uh, this whole data science uh, buzzword, um, really, it is a buzzword that we cannot deny now, right? So it is. Uh, but uh, uh, computer vision actually is data science. You are doing data science on images. Um, actuaries, they were doing data science in insurance industry, right? So some of you maybe, uh, maybe, uh, may have seen that, um, um, may have a degree in statistics, and uh, you already are doing, you have been doing data science, right, really. But it's a, it's a buzzword. Really, wherever you apply machine learning and stats in this space, uh, in, in whatever space you're applying it in, that's uh, really what uh, data science is. Uh, so why, why this talk? So, from my experience, uh, I see this unnecessary emphasis on uh, on machine learning, the machine, uh, the, uh, specifically the machine learning aspect of things, uh, the machine learning modeling part of it, uh, all the deep learning and support vector machines and uh, boosting and uh, gradient boost and random forest, right? So, so uh, I'm throwing terms at you, but some of you may have heard of this, and uh, the the problem that uh, uh, um, those of you who have, uh, who have practiced or are practitioners in machine learning, you would probably realize that uh, machine learning, the actual model building, it's a very tiny part of the, the actual problem. And people expect miracles to happen, right? So I will, I will get this uh, library, this uh, deep learning library, or this support vector machine library, and the life is going to be good, right? I will just take all my data and throw data at this model, or this learning algorithm and it will solve all the problems for me. But those of you who are practitioners, you know that. It doesn't work that way. It's only a very tiny uh, part of the problem. Even though there is that unnecessary emphasis on the learning or modeling part of it, machine learning is hard work. You have to spend time on your data, you're uh, choosing the right metrics, having the right understanding of the business. So uh, what uh, I will emphasize, uh, this is more of a beginner level tutorial. I would try not, uh, to avoid uh, the, the technicalities of it, uh, because um, one hour might not be enough for, to get into the deeper uh, discussions there. But what I would like to emphasize here is that you don't need to actually, uh, you don't need to know a lot of machine learning algorithms to actually do machine learning. That's the first, uh, first thing that I will uh, talk about. And what kind of problems can your, your data can have? If your data has problems, no matter what you do, your model is not going to be good. If you choose the wrong metric for uh, building the model, again, no matter what you do, your model is not going to be good, right? So, so it's a general uh, best practices uh, uh, type talk, and uh, we'll, uh, we will um, uh, we'll start with an example, and uh, we'll see uh, where we are uh, at the end of the presentation. So uh, let's take this example. Uh, so what is customer churn? Customer churn is when, uh, when you have a, a you are a subscription-based uh, business, and you don't want uh, people to leave your service. And now people start leaving, and the question is, it's a ve one of the most important applications out there for uh, machine learning and predictive modeling. So can you predict, really, that this customer is about to leave? That's your customer churn problem. I mean, I'm a T-Mobile customer, and can T-Mobile, can, uh, can they guess that Raja is about to leave T-Mobile? And Let's say I come up with a, uh, a model that predicts customer churn with 70% accuracy. My question for all of you is, do you think it's, it's a good model? A decent model, good enough model? It's better than 50%, right? So it looks better than 50%. 
So here is the problem that we are facing, right? Uh, I see these things, uh, so people, uh, you know, uh, 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 you're part of different uh, LinkedIn and Facebook groups and where everybody is sharing, hey, I built this model, it is 85% accurate. What does it even mean to have a model that is 85% accurate? Why, are we, why, are, why am I so happy about building a model that is 85% accurate? So I will talk about this, how, how, do you dissect, uh, how, how do you dissect this? If someone tells you that they built a model that uh, is that has this much accuracy or this much precision recall, what sort of questions would you ask them? Or at least, if you don't ask them, do you know, can you, can you spot what's wrong there? Maybe there's nothing wrong there, but at least in the absence of all the, the is there any information that is missing? So in this case, uh, the, the problem is that data literacy, it's, it's not very common. We, we look at some stats, uh, someone reports the numbers, and we would think that, yeah, I mean, it sounds about, uh, I mean, this model looks awesome, this, uh, this model looks like, horrible, right? So, so we'll talk about this. So let's ask some fundamental questions about this uh, problem. The question is, when someone reports that they had this model that is 70% accurate, the question is, what data was considered? What time frame the data was? How big was the data set? Was it only 10 examples, or 100, or 1,000, or 10,000 examples? The next thing is, what was the skew and balance? I will talk about this in a moment. How many, in your data set, how many uh, customers were actually, um, this is a supervised learning problem, right? So how many uh, uh, of these uh, uh, points in your data set, or uh, the rows, or records in your data set, how many of them were actually customers who churned, and how many of them were who did not churn? And did anything else change in the business? The business was already in a turmoil, right? I mean, so the business was going through this, and we are predicting churn, but the people were churning anyways, right? So, so you know, uh, so th these are the questions that we would ask. Then uh, the other thing is the metric question. What if the data set is from a period when the 70, when 70 percent uh, customers were already churning? So you pick any hundred customers, 70 percent would leave. My model said, everyone is leaving. Am I 70% accurate? Am I useful? It's my, so, I mean, if you look at it, you, uh, out of every 1,000 customers, 700 are already leaving, right? And my model is saying, everyone is leaving. My, I calculate the accuracy. Yes, yeah, 70% of the time, my model is correct. But what is the model actually doing? So, did you use the right metric? Yeah. What is that? In the minute, you don't have any errors of omission, but all your errors are coping. Oh, sorry, I could not hear you. You don't have any omission errors, but all your errors are coping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, uh, and uh, we will not get into the precision recall business, but uh, what I'm trying to say here is that sometimes, I mean, you might choose a metric that might make you look good, right? So, in this case, accuracy is an amazing metric, right? So, it makes my... I look, it looks like that I'm better than random guess, but there's not much value that I'm adding here, right? So I'm just not doing anything really. The next question is the repeatability question. Um, how many times did you repeat this? Is it that you handcrafted some sample to make your model look good? You would think it doesn't happen, right? It happens all the time, and especially in academia, uh, when you are trying to um, when you're trying to report the results. So you came up with the, this novel algorithm, right? So you have this new algorithm, and what do you do? You come up with this new algorithm, and uh, this new algorithm, uh, there are some benchmark data sets, and you will uh, on those benchmark data sets you will say, okay, I will keep running my uh, my own algorithm until it looks good, and for the for the other existing state of the art, I will keep them com coming up with shuffle, different shuffles for the data set until the state of the art looks inferior to my learning algorithm, and I go and re report the results. This is my, my algorithm is better than that, uh, better than that state of the art, and it happens all the time. So the question is, if you repeat, if you repeat your uh, given any random data set, because on a given data set, 
you might be looking good, you might be looking bad. But if you repeat this 10 times or 20 times on different random data sets, can you reproduce these results or not? 70% does not mean anything, really. Uh, one was for the data reason, the other one was uh, for the metric reasons. So there was a reason around data, right? So we talked about that. The second one was uh, the, the metric reason. Even, uh, even if you are correct on both the data and the, from the data and the metric angle, how you are measuring the performance, still, if you cannot reproduce it consistently, that means your model is not a good model. You, the, uh, your predictions, it may be a fluke. It, you just accidentally got something. Yes? So would you do like a Monte Carlo simulation? You would actually do some sort of, um, uh, and I will talk about only one technique at the end, cross-validation. You can do a bootstrap sampling. You can actually, uh, you, can, you will try to shuffle and um, demonstrate that it is repeatable. It is not an accident. Okay? Um, this is the most important that the question that is overlooked. This is, the, the customer churn model that we built, it is one of the best that we have ever built. But you have built this uh, customer churn model, and let's start calling them. Let's start calling them to stop these customers. Okay? So if you look at this, so this is an actual example, actually. Uh, this is this company called Telenor. They actually built this model that reduced the, uh, the customer turnover, customer churn, by 36%. Now, let's look at it. Let's, uh, let's visualize the situation. I'm very accurate in predicting customer churn. I hand this model to my business uh, team and tell them I'm very confident. 98% of the people that you call, or 90% of the people that my model says, are planning to leave, they are planning to leave. Your business tip, uh, team picks up the phone and starts calling these people. And the other person, your customer, picks up the phone and says, yeah, I've been waiting for your call. I want to leave. Okay. So you basically, you, you woke up this sleeping giant, right? So your customer was planning to leave, and they were lazy, and they were not, uh, they wanted to leave, but they were delaying that decision, right? You call them and you say, yeah, I mean, I want to leave. Thank you. And this uh, business teams come, uh, and now what happens? You, lo you lose a bunch of customers. You expedite their, their departure from your, for your company. So now this uh, the business team guy comes back and says, you told me that this is a good model. And now this guy says, did they leave? Yes, they did leave. Uh, I told you, right? So they are going to leave. And the business team, and now they are arguing, right? So, but think about this, that, I mean, uh, if, if this, uh, they knew how to use this model correctly, the situation might not have been like this. So this company, actually, two of these people, they, they, they attended one of our trainings in Singapore, so the, uh, two, two employees from this company, they said that they had a hierarchical model. The model was such that the first, time, first they will predict who's likely to leave or who's going to churn. And then the, there was another model that was run on all the people who were predicted to be churning. And then you will predict who's going to stay if called. Do you see this problem, right? So even though if it's a, it's a good model uh, built uh, with this amazing accuracy or precision recall, whatever that uh, metric may be. But if you don't use it in the right business context, that can be a problem as well. Is, uh, is uh, this uh, making sense to everyone? Uh, are we following this so far? Okay. Do you not have a control group that you can't call? Um, that you don't call? Yeah, uh, I mean, you would, you would always have a control group, right? So that's the best practice. But even after the control group, I mean, you saw that, I mean, uh, you, uh, the people you called, they, you expedited their departure earlier really because you, they were already upset and you predicted that they are, they are unhappy and you basically just called them and then expedited their departure. Maybe all of us, I think um, um, most of us, we are unhappy with some service. I sat on my Netflix account for, I don't know, three years until I canceled it. Uh, if they had called me, I would have said, I mean, cancel it right now. Uh, I am sitting on another uh, my Vonage account. Uh, I don't use it, nothing, but uh, paying $35, $40 a month. 
I'm not canceling it. If they call me, absolutely, I will just tell them. I mean, just, uh, just. Uh, I mean, I don't need you. So, it's uh, it's basically a machine learning used in the wrong, without a business context. It's actually it will hurt the business then uh, instead of helping it, right? So even if you have a control group and a treatment group, right? So we can do all of that, but. Uh, if it's a bad model, and if it's a good model used incorrectly, you will see the problem. If they predict that mm -hmm. you leave, yeah, uh, so you the second step, mm -hmm. or you do the call to make <coughs> yeah, but uh, to uh, the the question here is that uh, would they uh, uh, would they stay? Because some customers, they might not stay no matter what. Because uh, coming up with an offer, that's, that is yet another predictive modeling problem. Uh, so, because you don't want to uh, start giving away one year of free service to everyone, right? You will say, if someone can stay with one month of free service, let's offer them one month of free service and no nothing more than that. Because uh, you cannot really do a one-size-fits-all type approach, right? So, and, uh, and this is the kind of business context that uh, we are talking about here, right? So if you don't have that understanding of the business, so I might say, yeah, I mean, if uh, any, everyone who's staying, if you give them one year of free credit uh, to the service, they will stay. But what is the cost to the business for that? Is it even worth stopping uh, or keeping the customer? And also another point is that not all customers are equally profitable. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so, you may want to worry more about uh, uh, customers that are uh, you, that you make more money from versus uh, low value customer right so that's uh, that's very true any other thoughts comments and the, I mean, if you look at this this has n i mean we have not we are not even talking about machine learning here really per se right so we did not talk about whether deep learning was used or the uh, 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 boosting was used or random forest was used we did not talk about anything you're talking about everything outside of that uh, that black box uh, um, th that is used for building that model. Yes. Can the model be built in uh, this predict phases of the so let's say somebody waits for six rather than only predicting that after leaving uh, the service hub, it predicts now they have started getting frustrated and at the end of its spectrum. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how you do it. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Can it, can it be a spectrum? Yeah, uh, I mean, it, de it depends upon how you, uh, how, you, how you lay your problem out, right? So uh, maybe, um, uh, maybe if, it, if you s uh, set this as a churn versus no churn, you will call this uh, a classification problem in a, in a machine learning context, right? If you give them some sort of scores, um, that uh, absolutely ha are happy with the service versus neutral versus absolutely disgusted, right? If you have this, it's a ranking problem, right? So you will rank people or uh, maybe a regression problem where you assign them some sort of scores, right? So uh, it depends how you lay your problem out, but, and, uh, and you will lay your problem out in a, uh, you will set the problem uh, up in a way uh, this, again, uh, overly used and abused word of actionable insights, right? So anything that is actionable, because you can get any insight, but is it really actionable? So uh, you will come up with something in a way that uh, when you give it to the business team or when you give it to some other partner team, can they actually act upon it or not? So that's, uh, uh, that's uh, the high-level idea. So you will, you will make sure that the model that you're building, it is consistent with, uh, uh, with, with the, um, how the business wants to use it. Otherwise, there would be a disconnect. Okay. Any other thoughts, questions? Yes. Yeah. I guess I don't understand exactly how the business model is wrong here, other than <coughs> our, our assumption is that you're going to call the people that you have most highly identified, probably going to leave, and that some proportion of them will accelerate their leaving faster. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't see how that necessarily means that the model or the idea or the business is a bad idea because you're going to have some rate of people who are going to leave and mm 
mm -hmm. the rate of people who are going to stay longer and the opportunity of having them stay longer, mm -hmm. all of those things seem to need to play in to, to decide whether or not okay. you're using your model. So I, I don't think, so uh, uh, I emphasize that the model is not a bad model. I never said that model is a bad model. Sure. It is basically the person building the model if he does not, he or she does not understand how the model is going to be, um, how the model is going to be used, eventually, the model can backfire. It can hurt more than help, and that's why I was saying that. I mean, this company, this specific company, I, uh, I mean, uh, people who were uh, related to this, uh, they, I, I was talking to them. They, saw, they said that they had a hierarchical approach. First, you detect who is going to leave, and the second, uh, second time around you will uh, say, okay, uh, out of these, who's very likely to stay? And only, uh, uh, it may be a resource issue as well, right? If you have 10,000, uh, your model saying that 10,000 people are going to leave, would you go and pursue everyone? You have, where you, you, uh, your call center can only make 1,000 calls, possibly? You will actually say, okay, let's find the customers who are going to stay, who are very likely to stay, or most likely to stay, let's call them up. There's far more business value in that versus, yeah. uh, versus just randomly uh, calling everyone. Okay? So the conclusion here is that, uh, uh, that a, a good model with bad business judgment is a bad model. This is, I think, no rocket science here, right? So because um, as much as uh, a lot of people would want to think, when your business does not care how, ma how sophisticated your model is and how, how, clever, uh, the, uh, you, how cleverly you proved the error bounds and all of that in your, I mean, theories aside, if it doesn't bring any value to the business, it is a bad model, no matter, regardless of how good the, mo uh, the model actually was. So that's, that's uh, common sense, but not common practice. Mm -hmm. didn't recognize the right problem mm -hmm. to translate it to a model and machine learning and mm -hmm. something like that. The problem is that is who, who among these people who are about to share and whom we can kill. But he thought that, okay, or she thought that, okay, who is sharing? Mm -hmm. Who is the next to leave? Yeah, and, and that is why uh, anyone... Um, Anyone who is building a model must have a very good understanding of business as well, the domain and the business. And I would actually go on to say that even uh, a dev who has a better understanding of business, but is slightly less technical than a dev who is a dev, really, you know, a good dev, uh, but does not understand business, I would rather go for someone who has a slightly too, too, uh, super solid dev, less super solid dev, but this one has a better understanding of business, I will go for this one and not for this one because this guy may come up with and he will insist, yeah, I mean, look at the library that I wrote. I mean, what's the business use for this library for me, right? I mean, it's, a, it's the same example here, right? So you want to, you want to have uh, that understanding of business whenever you're building a predictive model. So you're, so you're, you're not really saying the model uh, bad. Sorry, uh, yeah, uh, for uh, you and then, uh, yeah, yeah. So you're not really saying the model bad, you're just saying that the whole exercise of this mm -hmm. creation of the mm -hmm. model yeah, it's yeah. Useless. yeah, it's yeah. overall, I mean, so in the end, uh, uh, what I'm trying to say here is, uh, it is the business value that you extract out of uh, your data science and machine learning um, uh, process. It is that what, ma what matters, and not specifically how clever your implementation was and yeah. uh, what kind of library that you're using, yes. Actually, I think uh, I think uh, you. Uh, you're talking with someone who's a doctor for for cancer. Mm -hmm. So in order to better understand the data behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so uh, um, if if you don't understand the problem space, if you don't understand your domain, there's no way you can build a good model because uh, there. Are, uh, you uh, you cannot extract good features out of your data. Sometimes your feature may, features may not be even obvious to you. They might not be sitting right there in front of you. You may have to do some sort of transformation and uh, so many things. 
So uh, I think uh, 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 anyone who has a better understanding of domain is going to be far more useful than someone who just understands theory inside out <laughs> and does not understand the domain. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there something in machine learning also where a business person who is not data scientist can build the model on their own because they have mm -hmm. business context much more than uh, data mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Right? So the question is in, in the traditional BI or traditional uh, descriptive analytics, um, of someone with an understanding of the domain can go and build a dashboard. Uh, upon request, and uh, can, again, we have something in the predictive uh, or machine learning context. So, even in that scenario, I would say that if the person is not data literate, I mean, so they may have understanding of uh, the domain, but if they don't understand the the intricacies of how the biases and everything around data that are possible, your reports, reports might not be accurate even then, right? So you're I mean, there can be uh, sampling uh, issues. Uh, you're taking the wrong sample. You're taking uh, data from only one day, whereas uh, the representation actually uh, for uh, getting a representative sample, you should consider at least one week worth of data, right? You are ignoring certain certain segments. So th things can happen, but, uh, but you have a point. But in a predictive context, you are actually, you are handing this business person a working model and you have made some assumptions when you were building the models. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, so um, the analogy would be is that um, the business person knows how to build a new model from scratch because the end product is that plot, that graph, and uh, that report. And essentially, um, the the business person is reusing the all the data to create a new report, right? In this case, if they, the business person knows how to build a model from scratch, well, yeah, I mean, they can do it. But they cannot just simply tweak the model to actually just get a different outcome from that. Maybe, maybe not, but in general, no. Might not be possible. Uh, can bots can build a model by taking inputs? Sorry, can you repeat that? Can bots, can, uh, bots can build a model by taking inputs? Mm -hmm. uh, so you're talking about uh, machine learning for machine learning, right? So machine learning can, can, that can do machine learning, right? Who's going to train, train that bot? Uh, some data scientist. And what is that data scientist going to use? So you're uh, mm -hmm. so, okay. So you're saying that uh, <laughs> yeah. So that there is a desire, right? So I, I know that uh, uh, we want to uh, we want, uh, there is a desire that uh, the machines can learn on their own, as much as the industry and the press and journalists they want to make you believe that machines can learn on their own. Machines are dumb. Machine learning algorithms are as smart as the person training these machine learning uh, models, right? So, um, uh, I mean, there have been some efforts around that. Uh, uh, to some extent, they can figure things out. But in the end, some human has to actually go and, uh, and intervene. So, not yet. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, in a sort of generalizability, cross-validation kind of way. But you know, another aspect of repeatability is a model that continues to be true in a <coughs> changing world. Yes, absolutely. In, in every sense of the word. I, I did not uh, get there. Yes, absolutely. I had a perfectly good model of mm -hmm. how my business churned mm -hmm. last year when yes. I ran last year's promotions. Mm -hmm. and, um, and now this year, we have different promotions mm -hmm. that Absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, that's that's a, that's a great point that uh, David brings in. He's a practitioner, so he knows <laughs> what uh, what it means. Right? So the the repeatability was I was saying was that if you have a given data set, on that data set, if I pick up, okay, let's take 
this random variation and see if my model does well. Take another random variation from the existing data set and then uh, whether it does well or not. But what David is pointing out is, what if, the, what if your data, essentially the distribution in, in more technical terms, what if the distribution of the data is changing, right? So you uh, had uh, um, your Amazon and uh, you had only, uh, you did not even have a, uh, a footwear category, I'm making it up, right? And suddenly a new category gets introduced on your e-commerce website and which is a footwear category. And then you bring this category in, would the data be the same? No. Would the behavior be the same? No. Whatever model that you learn, it is going to degrade over time as more customers come in, as more categories come in, and as the ground realities change. So that is another source of variation that is absolutely uh, possible. So models keep evolving. Yeah, I mean, that's the, and that's why these companies, they have people on their payroll. Otherwise, they will just hire them, and then they will say, yeah, I mean, uh, you, your job is done, right? So, but uh, the, 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 the business realities are changing. You have more data. You're, you're going out and seeking more features and improving your models, right? And sometimes your models will automatically de degrade just by virtue of, uh, by, by, uh, due to the fact that you have different kind of data now. You have, uh, maybe you had, on a given day, you had more bots. Those don't represent your actual, uh, actual real customers. What's going to happen? Your model will degrade. You have, now you have marketing uh, traffic that is coming in. So all of these things do impact your model. And that is why these, uh, these companies, they have these uh, armies of machine learning engineers and data scientists who actually um, keep working on these models and fi keep fixing these models. So models uh, have some assumption. With the assumption changes, then the, the, uh, the, the fundamental assumption behind a model is that the distribution of future data that you, the model is going to be used on is the same as the data that it was trained on. And this, mo this assumption is really accurate. I, I can also tell you, it's a, it's a big assumption. We assume that this is going to be the case, but in most practical real-world business problems, this doesn't, this doesn't happen. It keeps changing, and that's why you have to, you're, uh, you're really, you're in a catch-up mode. You are always fixing and fixing your models, and fix, you fix it, something changes, you fix it, something changes, and so on. Okay? So, uh, modern machine learning libraries, they are actually extremely easy. If, uh, how many of you uh, use uh, R or have used R? Python? Scikit-learn? Pandas? OK, TensorFlow? OK. So, uh, and you would actually agree with me that building a machine learning model is, it's not even a big deal. And I've, I've shown this uh, R example just as a sample. You split your data into train and test samples. This is a random forest model. Literally, you tell that you want to predict survival. Tilde dot, dot means all the columns. And you pass it the Titanic data set. And now when you get, want to get predictions, you use this predict function, and done. This is, this is what it is. And it may sound like something, yeah, I mean, I can do machine learning. <laughs> but the reality is, a lot of it happens before, uh, before you bring this data in, into it into this library. A lot of feature uh, uh, cleaning of features and, uh, and uh, um, uh, extracting features, uh, uh, bringing more data. And then uh, after that, evaluation. Are you evaluating your uh, model correctly or not? Uh, uh, did you make sure that you, uh, your, your mo the model that you're building, the performance is repeatable or not, right? So th yes? Do you have a slide that shows the output of this? I don't actually. This is just an example here. Because but I've used R, and you know, you're right. It's easy to mm -hmm. code it, mm -hmm. and then you get a grid, and then you realize you better run back to your statistics book to go figure out what uh, mm -hmm. adjusted R is. Yes, they are both a blessing and a curse at the same time. Yeah, because uh, it they they these uh, the modern libraries they make it look so easy. I call it. Uh, I call them a blessing and a curse at the same time because uh, if they make things easy for you, if you know what you're doing, and if you don't know what you're doing, they create an illusion of understanding. You might think that uh, you understand, not you uh, as in you, but general. Uh, any uh, like one one might think that uh, they understand machine learning, 
But the reality is that they don't, right? It's just that they figured out the library somehow, and that's it. Okay. So, how uh, how do you build uh, uh, machine learning models, and what is the right approach? So here is uh, here is what uh, we have here. You start with a business question. You don't start with uh, uh, you don't actually start with uh, um, the machine learning model, because uh, for a uh, for a newbie. Uh, a person who just started, they might say, yeah, I will go and use uh, this, uh, this amazing library that I found, found out, uh, the deep learning library or TensorFlow and just something like that. But the reality is that you will ask the business question first. Um, then the next thing would be some janitorial work, uh, uh, a lot of cleaning. Data is never clean. And uh, if you have clean data, you're not working on a problem that matters. Real-world data sets are never clean. They're messy. Uh, multi uh, so duplicate clicks or missing clicks or duplicate queries or missing queries and uh, bot traffic. I mean, so real-world data sets are messy. Then the next thing would be is uh, building the model. You did build the model, but do you know how to evaluate the model? Do you know how to tune the model? Do you know uh, how to... Uh, how to set the uh, choose the right parameters? Um, did you is your tree at the um, is a five level deep tree the right uh, one or ten level deep tree is the uh, right one or not? Um, uh, if you're using regularization, uh, are you uh, using the right amount of penalty so the model is uh, complex enough or not complex enough? Right. So all of those trade offs you have to really be aware of that. And you this is what we call the parameter tuning. You will tune the model in a way that it, uh, it, gets the best, uh, it gets the best performance out of your circumstances, whatever data you have. And then eventually, you will do some more validation uh, on blind holdout data and uh, online experimentation, A-B testing. And we will we'll talk about uh, these steps one by one. So the first question, well, what I said was, ask uh, uh, the business question. You should always start with the business question first when you're building a predictive model, right? Um, where is, what is it that uh, will bring value to the, to the business? Um, you are always going to be doing something that increases your revenue, improves your profit margins, reduce cost, improves customer satisfaction, and really adds business value in general. And uh, you, uh, if you are, um, you've spent some time in industry, you will see that uh, someone uh, very smart, brilliant, they will come up with and suggest something. Yeah, I mean, looks great. But why, why should we do this? What's the point doing this? Yeah, I mean, I, I love it. It's a great idea. What value is it bringing to the business? So uh, the question always starts with, uh, what will help the business? Um, so how do you start with this? Uh, so uh, if you have some, so uh, you, you know machine learning now. You, you have some idea how to build machine learning models. How do you identify um, uh, what, uh, what would be a good model to build? Or what, would be, what should we do uh, in machine learning given uh, our situation? You will ask these questions, right? So we have too many frauds that are happening. If we did this, it will result in this business metric. Um, if we could predict customer churn, what if we could forecast sales? If we could forecast sales, this will happen. So you always will actually keep thinking about uh, this uh, wishful thinking. Let me put it this way, right? So something is not happening right now in your business, and you uh, will ask this question, I wish if we were able to do this, that would add business value. The next thing is, uh, um, has anyone heard of this, uh, this thing? It's popular. <laughs> Right? Uh, so so you, you, find, you, you come up, came up with this business question. Um, you decided that you want to predict, uh, you want to forecast sales. What is the next thing that you will do? The next thing that you will do is you will say, go and ask this question, what are, what are certain things, what are uh, some pointers in, 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 uh, in uh, Machine learning language, we call them features or predictors, right? What are some pre predictors of features that can help me predict sales? 
you will go and start looking at, yeah, I know that table in that database, that has some information around sales, and maybe that other team uh, in my company, they have some information, and maybe this third party data, if we can just bring it in, join it with our existing data set, that will help us uh, forecast sales better. So the first thing uh, uh, here is going to be getting the, the right data. If you don't have the right data, garbage in, garbage out. That's, uh, that's the rule, right? So you, you must get the, uh, the, uh, the representation, representative data, and then build the model. Um, but there are, uh, the, so the generally this, uh, the idea uh, around this uh, data beats algorithm is that if you have, uh, if you have uh, good data, even a simple um, and okay machine learning uh, uh, algorithm, it will still help you. But if you have uh, bad data, uh, even a, a, a better, a relatively better machine learning algorithm, it might not be able to actually help you. So it starts with the right data. The next thing is, uh, you want uh, uh, lots of data. How much data do you, do you need in general? What would be your decision? Uh, how would you decide how much data for a given problem? I'm throwing a very vague question at all of you. What would be some considerations? Okay, um, sure, that would be one consideration, yeah. But um, hmm. let's, uh, yeah, uh, uh, definitely, okay. Any other consideration? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, if, uh, uh, if the data is still representative or not, right? So that's probably what you're saying, right? So if the data is old. Or, so you want some sort of... Uh, uh, Representation, right? So uh, I would freshness is only one aspect of representation, but maybe uh, women versus men, uh, uh, elderly versus uh, young, um, uh, people living in this zip code versus that zip code. Yes. I was just going to say wealth sampling. You don't want to just have. So you don't want to ask who's the new president to own a Republican. Mm -hmm. Because you get a very different answer. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, yes. Uh, number of dimensions, uh, can you elaborate a bit? Like if you have something where there's, um, you know, 50 different dimensions that you're trying to find the right optimization for, mm -hmm. um, that might require a much larger data set that's made with, like, there's two different possibilities or two different... Mm -hmm. So uh, is your concern that uh, if there are too many dimensions, is, the, uh, is your learning going to be uh, difficult on too many dimensions or...? Okay, okay, yep. Can, can you relate this sort of like to traditional statistics where you figure a sample size based on the power that you want to have? Yeah, so you would actually be, so I, 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 I'm glad that you brought this up because um, um, st traditional statisticians, they still call this an estimation, right? So we call it predictive modeling, but it is, it is an estimation problem, right? So uh, I'm going to be 80% accurate. It's an estimate. It's not a guarantee that it is going to be 80% accurate. It's just an estimate. Just like uh, uh, if, I, if I go and um, a, a toy problem, right? So a toy problem would be is that what is the average age of uh, uh, everyone living in Redmond? How would you go about estimating that? You have to figure out what you will probably, level is. Yeah, what confidence level, what's the distribution, uh, right? So. Uh, you will go and say, oh, yeah, maybe if I had, uh, if I went for, uh, and I think for certain things, um, uh, most people actually can obviously tell uh, that it's wrong. For instance, if I told you, yeah, I would step out and ask the first five people who are passing by and take their average and say, yeah, this is the average age. What's wrong with this approach? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's not big enough sample. So uh, just come up with, uh, just throw a number. What, 100, 500? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just, I mean, uh, because we cannot go into the, all the technicalities, but maybe someone said, yeah, we need 500 samples. You get enough to where your inference doesn't change. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, and I, uh, so someone said 500, I said, yeah, I mean, I can go to this elementary school. I mean, 500 kids, I mean, as they come out, I will ask them their age. 
what's wrong with this approach? Not random. Not random. It's not random enough, or maybe I will, so. If you said no, uh, if you said no, ra not random, I will say okay. I will pick every tenth kid. So, but what's wrong with that? Still not random. It is random. It is still random. Not Okay, so I mean, if a, if a kid comes by and I will flip a coin and decide whether I should ask this yeah, kid or not. Yeah, but you're asking minors, and that's not the it is, representative. It is, it is not representative so enough, right? It is not representative enough, right? So, so it is ingrained in our, like, in our brains, really. You don't have to be a statistician to understand this. But somehow when we do machine learning, we forget this. So the same thing applies. When you're building a machine learning model, you have to have the right sample size. The right sample size that can get, come up with a good estimate. And a representative sample. And uh, going back to the same problem, right? So uh, if, you, um, if you go and ask people their age, they might lie. Data quality issue. You might want to verify. I mean, if you want uh, the estimate to be correct, you might want to verify. Show us your ID, possibly, right? So, so all of those things, they matter, right? So data quality and variety. And, um, and besides, you have, to, uh, you have to actually extract useful features out of your, uh, out of your data. So that's sometimes the, uh, the, the, the features or predictors that are needed, they might not be right there in front of you. You may have to do some sort of transformation to actually get the features out of it. Um, there is this common myth, right? So some, some, sometimes people would think that there is a, yeah, we'll take this black box and put every, no matter what data is given to us, I mean, this, this algorithm is amazing, right? So we'll just give it anything, it will just come up with a model. It doesn't happen this way, it doesn't work that way. So this is, uh, this is a myth. And um, the other thing is that you have to really make sure that you spend, uh, um, I call it the 80-20 rule, spend a lot of time on your data that will save you a lot of trouble later on when you build the model. If you spend, uh, do your due diligence while handling data, acquiring data, cleaning data, engineering your features, it will save you a lot of trouble when you have actually built the model. Your model is going to be far more robust and better if, it, if you do your due diligence in the, data, uh, in the data stage, let's call it the whole data stage from collection to all the way to feature engineering and cleaning and so on. Um, there is the, this idea, um, um, acquire as much data you, the, as you can. Sometimes uh, the data may be sitting somewhere nearby and you may not know that the data even exists. Some, some customer data, you are, Someone came and told you, yeah, I mean, we need to predict this, and I think go to that table, and you are just stuck with that table in the, a given database. But maybe there is another table in the same database. Maybe your partner team has some data set. Maybe the third party has some data set. Go and get as much data as possible. More data is always better than less data, okay? Um, the question is, can everything be predicted? That's also a very interesting problem, right? So, I mean, so, can you predict uh, customer churn? Yeah, I mean, companies use it, but it will again depend upon what data you have. Outcome of election results, can that be predicted? Yeah, it can be predicted, but how accurate is the prediction? So I, was, uh, I saw a lot of uh, interesting uh, um, tweets and blog posts around data science failed in the recent presidential elections. Has anyone, does anyone have any, any thoughts on that? Did data science actually fail or something else happened? Maybe it failed, maybe it didn't. Well, yeah. There were a lot of people that were undecided and they hadn't yet been mm -hmm. polled. Yeah. So the, the, the uh, people that were polled were the ones that said, yes, I'm voting, I'm gonna vote for Hillary or I'm voting for Trump. Mm -hmm. Those were the knowns, but the unknowns were what was missing. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, yeah, that's a, that's a great point, yes. Mm -hmm. 
But they have worked in the past. I think they have largely worked in most elections. They have worked, but I mean, there was something different about this election that they did not work, right? So, mm -hmm. a few few models did work, right? But um, and many, um, most notably, I think Nate Silver's model did not work, right? So that was. No, no it worked. Yeah, he, mm -hmm. he didn't get the right outcome, but he mm -hmm. said there was a thirty-seven split of possibilities. That's damn near a coin toss. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I mean that you bring up another point, right? So I mean, so yeah, I mean it. Uh, it, it was within that <laughs> range of confidence, right? So yeah, I mean, well yeah. Okay, so um, uh, just the fundamental assumption when you build a, um, a model like this, a predictive model, is that the da the distribution of future data is going to be similar to <coughs> the, uh, the past. But what if the voters change their mind because of some news coming in? It's not the same data anymore, right? What if uh, people were did not actually uh, did not actually uh, they were not uh, um, they were not uh, really candid about who they are going to vote for, right? They maybe they said something and they said it otherwise. What if the people who said that they will vote for a certain candidate did not show up at the polling station? Data science cannot take care of that. Uh, so, so all of those things are there because these are very well established techniques. And uh, yes, um, your predictions can be wrong. But there are so many factors that again revolve around your data. If your data changes, your predictions are going to be messed up. I think that the big factor that mm -hmm. you bring is that uh, a lot of people who used to vote didn't go to polling for this specific election. And a lot of people who went to polling for this specific mm -hmm. election didn't vote this before. You are, I mean, the data, the, the Polling is, but polling wasn't good representative because a lot of people um, just voted because of the dyna different dynamics of this mm -hmm. um, election, and some people didn't go. To vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so uh, a lot of things, uh, right? So, I mean, and that's that's what is tricky about when you're working on data. That's what is tricky about working on data. That. Uh, well, again, they missed it. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. As you mentioned before, uh, people who built those models didn't predict or didn't notice that the uh, population mm -hmm. is changing. It's not the same as four years before. Yeah, I mean, so uh, I mean, they have been building this for a long time, and now they did not factor certain things and and maybe they could not have factored everything in right so it's it's very difficult sometimes to predict everything that is possible like yes. one of the models that i like the most is like hurricane models right we have the european the us and all those models are different and mm -hmm. at some point and they kind of you know yeah. sometimes they're Diverge, uh -huh. and sometimes they, mm -hmm. they they come yeah. together yeah. and it's and you would think and in, then you would think that they would have same similar data, weather data, mm -hmm. yet they come up with different. Yeah, yeah. I mean, whatever uh, whatever approach you you took, I mean, it will result in different yeah. uh, outcomes. Yes. So you mentioned future. I think you refer to data attributes. Yes, uh, we are referring to uh, the data attributes. Yes. Uh, so in case of plain text, what are the features or the dimensions? So you use some techniques, uh, natural language processing, some text analytics to actually convert data into an equivalent representation. Uh, so there are ways to actually convert. So um, uh, you might be seeing uh, some, uh, something as a tweet, whereas the machine learning model, they only works on columns and rows, right? So you will convert every tweet into uh, a bunch of uh, a row with a bunch of columns. and uh, if you have 10,000 tweets, all of them will be a bunch of rows and columns. And uh, so there are actually te techniques to handle that. But uh, good question. Yes, I mean, there are actually models that predict stock, uh, stock prices, but they are probably not for, not for everyone, right? So and, um, because they, uh, so these companies that do, uh, are in this business, they hire uh, the best and the brightest from the topmost colleges, the best coders and best machine learning, right? So uh, best of everything. 
and uh, to the point that they actually have their servers very close to where the piece of information is because uh, even a few seconds, a few milliseconds of lag that can actually uh, impact the decision making, right? So yes, so it can be predicted. The next market crash yeah. is the next market crash is coming, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, but, and, uh, but it's interesting, right, uh, that uh, uh, if, if this, this becomes uh, more commoditized, these high-speed trading models, then uh, what, would, uh, what would it look like? What would stock market look like? Because it's almost like uh, it depends upon uh, which service is bidding on my behalf, right? Uh, uh, because humans are going to lose uh, because machines can process so much data uh, so quickly. So that's, uh, yeah. How would you find then um, the, the good model when you compare uh, what, what difference should be between the prediction and accurate results? 10% um, like difference? Okay. Um, Um, that's a great question. Let me try to come up with uh, um, an example uh, here. Um, well, like an example of the 70% of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think um, uh, for some problems, having a model that is 90% accurate, it might not be enough. Because it's a very simple problem, right? It's uh, almost like, uh, I mean, what's the big deal, right? So anyone can do it, right? But for some problems, even getting a model that is 60% accurate, it might be incredibly hard. So there is no fixed constant number for a metric. And it might not even be accuracy that you're looking for. Right. You might be completely, totally uh, looking for something different. So there's no, there is no common metric across all the problem domains. So in some cases, you might look for accuracy. In some Mm -hmm. That's how you rank them by... Yeah, you will compare them, but uh, there's more to it, and I think it, the, that may be a somewhat of an involved discussion. Um, but I think the way we should look at this is that... Uh, I think your question was, is 70% is, uh, is a good accuracy or not? Is 80% a good accuracy or not? And uh, my answer is I cannot comment on it, unless I know the problem domain, I know what data was available, and I, I, or I know what was the state of the art. I mean, what has someone else built already? If I know that 10 other people have built a model on the same data set that is consistently showing 90% accuracy, anything that is less than 90% is bad. But if nobody has even reached 60%, no matter what they did, 60% is great accuracy, right? So, or, or the uh, even more fundamental question might be is, is accuracy the right way to even measure that metrics or not, me that metric or not, just like what we saw here, right? Um, so um, I think the answer would be it depends upon uh, the problem space. And you, you had some comments? A good example of that, I think, is fraud detection, because let's say you have 100 million transactions a day, mm -hmm. credit card. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is going to actually be fraud where you have to test it there mm -hmm. for accuracy. Yeah, yeah even 99.9% .9 is not accurate. Yep, so yep, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Rock, yeah, that's a good example, right? Uh, area under curve kind of techniques. Yeah, and you might go to a uh, recall or a precision based on what the problem is space is, right? Yes. So any given uh, accuracy close to uh, 100% uh, could be considered not good enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's, uh, that's a great point. Yep. Um, and if you are, uh, I think, also be aware uh, of this thing. If you consistently get um, accuracies in the range of 98, 99% or something along those lines, you're probably solving a problem that nobody cares about. Because if it was that easy, 
you would not even need a model for that. Real world uh, models, they would actually uh, not have that uh, high uh, performances, right? So, I mean, uh, in general, you would need a predictive model for something that's unpredictable, right? And if it is so predictable, what's the big deal? <laughs> so, uh, uh, be aware of the, uh, the, these kind of pitfalls uh, there. Um, let me see, I think I will quickly try to wrap up. It's already 7.30. Uh, let me uh, let me quickly talk about this, right? So in this case, um, uh, oh, what what features uh, would you use? There is this example. Um, I, I found this uh, somewhere that uh, that Facebook uh, recognizes faces with a ninety-seven percent accuracy, and they they claim that. Uh, and I'm talking about recognition, not detection, right? So you recognize who this person is with a 97% accuracy, and it is performing better than humans. What is going on? How can an algorithm be better than humans? Is it possible? Of course. Okay, so uh, is it a level playing field? Yeah, I mean, I was, uh, yeah. Uh, but what kind of magic, I mean, so, um, I mean, it's almost like, I mean, so I keep hearing the um, um, uh, deep learning and Watson. These are two things that you keep hearing, right? So Watson won Jeopardy, right? Uh, so is it really Watson that won Jeopardy or something else? Yes. I was going to say that the kind of stuff that's very, very, very close together. You can recognize faces that you've ever seen or you've seen because those are all the pictures. That yeah. No, but I mean, we are, we are talking about, no, I mean, the, uh, if the trained test sets are the same, this, uh, that's a wrong practice fundamentally. So um, I'm assuming Not Facebook. Exactly. Facebook did not do that, right? So, um, they did not report results in that fashion, right? So I'm assuming that they were following all the best practices, and these are actual uh, uh, test sets. They were never used in training and so on, right? So, but they still uh, uh, showed these results. And uh, here's the thing. Uh, do you think that humans are at a disadvantage in this case? Because humans are only looking at these based on Visual similarity, yeah. yeah. In terms of the, the accuracy, is it saying the accuracy of like knowing that this is from Bob's? Yeah, so this is uh, Bob and this is Joe and this is Jen, right? Only people who are totally with Bob, like you have a hundred different options of who face it could be, or is it mm -hmm. Of course, of course. I mean, so I mean, uh, based on whether I know them or not. I mean, of course. I mean, they, I would expect them to have run tests like this, right? So, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So I know that I know everyone in the picture, whether I can recognize them or not. Uh, what advantage does uh, uh, do I have an advantage or the algorithm? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, you had something? Well, I, maybe it's related. Like, not everybody is equally important from those people. So, if it's somebody that is your 500th friend, mm -hmm. you don't really care if you can recognize them. Mm -hmm. really, but you ought to be able to get your wife right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, here's the thing, right? So, um, uh, mostly when humans uh, do it, humans are going to, uh, the only cue that they have is more of a visual cue, right? So they look at it, and maybe I recognize this person. Yeah, I mean, if this is this person, then this must be the person next to that person, right? But in the case of a machine learning algorithm or the Facebook algorithm, they know they have a lot of other context. They know who liked this image or uh, who shared, who commented, who tagged it who viewed it, and so they have far more information than what you would, exp that, you would ex uh, that a human would have, right? So it is inherently, humans are at a disadvantage. Um, uh, we call it features, right? So uh, uh, um, a Facebook uh, algorithm that is recognizing faces has far more information than a human to actually come up with this conclusion. So yeah, I mean, this is uh, uh, no surprises. It's not that magically, uh, Deep learning is figuring this out. Deep learning actually is relying on something that actually is figuring this out. I mean, it's just like the Watson uh, thing, right? So IBM has done an amazing, amazing job in, um, in evangelizing Watson. 
but you, you, uh, you, if you had given any other machine learning library to the same f uh, group of people who built those algorithms, they would have come up with the same outcome. It is, it is, n it is not Watson that did it. <laughs> but somehow, uh, uh, based on the, uh, my experience with the number of people, they think that it, it, it is actually IBM Watson that did all of this without realizing that it is not Watson. Okay, so, um, so what are some data related activities that you will uh, be involved in? Uh, acquiring data from all possible sources, sampling, transforming, cleansing, data exploration, visualization, feature engineering, tons of things that you would do here, and this is the most uh, painful step in your machine uh, in your machine learning uh, model building cycle. Yes. So you say IBM has done a better job constructing the data to go into the model than the other people have done? Yeah, so I, 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 I would I would say that right. Yeah. yeah. That's really yeah. Yep. They have. They actually. Um, uh, they um, employed the best people to work on that project, um, and they got the results that they wanted. The next thing is uh, let's let's wrap it up very quickly. Uh, what does success look like? I think uh, we have to uh, we have to actually be very clear about uh, what is it that you want out of your uh, model. And I think some of you have already mentioned uh, this example. If I have an, uh, a model that actually predicts, uh, uh, this is the situation, right? I'm predicting frauds. Uh, you have number of uh, non-frauds as 9,990, and number of uh, uh, frauds is only 10. My model says nothing is a fraud. Life is good. Is my model accurate? It is very accurate, actually. In a machine learning context, we are uh, we are not talking about uh, accuracy in uh, in English, right? So we're talking in a machine learning context. Accuracy is um, accuracy is your total number of correct predictions. When the prediction is uh, when you say it is a fraud, and it was actually a fraud, mm -hmm. we call them true positives or true negatives. So you basically your correct predictions divided by your total number of predictions, and in that case, looks great. And in those scenarios, we have some metrics, which are call, uh, we call them precision and recall, uh, and F, uh, F score, F, F measure. So all of those uh, metrics exist. But this is not it. It is not only going to be, is it, it's not going to be just, uh, it is not always going to be that you are uh, in a situation where it's uh, yes and no, and fraud and non-fraud, or bot and non-bot, right? So sometimes you might need uh, how far off are you, uh, like Zillow? Zillow would not say whether you're, accurate, accurate, you're, you're accurate or not. I mean, you would not measure a Zillow prediction predict model, uh, whether it is correct or not, or what is the accuracy. You're going to say, how, how much does it deviate from the actual price? If uh, the house price was um, a million, did it predict 900,000 or 1.1 million? And then, and basically, you will sum it up, which is called the mean absolute error, or mean squared error, or root mean squared error. So, uh, there are the point here is to actually uh, give you an idea that there are other metrics for other problems. If you're in a ranking setting, you might not want to use mean absolute error. You might want to use a metric called NDCG. So, uh, use choose the right metric for your problem. If you don't choose the right metric for your problem, if you don't measure it correctly, you don't know what's going on. So the next thing is, what if I built my model? And uh, I think it is awesome. And in production, it is, doesn't look that awesome. Is it possible? Sure. It happens all the time. OK? So uh, uh, and, uh, uh, how, how do we find out? I mean, so my model shows an accuracy of 90% in the training environment. But the question is, would my model be equally accurate when I deploy it? I'm predicting customer churn 90% of the 90% uh, correctly in my training set. My training set is my historical data, but you don't build a predictive model to do well on the training data. Training data is just a proxy for what is to come in future, right? So if you build a predictive model that looks 90% accurate in your training data, what is the guarantee that it is going to look equally accurate? in the future? Zero. Uh, zero uh, yeah, I mean, depends upon I mean, how, how skeptical you are. But 
uh, and there are actually uh, there are formal ways actually uh, of well, uh, verifying this. So there is this concept of uh, generalization, and uh, in machine learning, generalization is extremely extremely important. You have to build a model that is generalizable. And what is a generalizable model? Well, the the way the name sounds, right? So you want to build a model that is um, no matter what data set you bring in, of course, from the same domain, the same distribution, no matter what data set you bring in, I roughly perform the same way. If your model can uh, uh, exhibit these characteristics, it is a generalizable model. And uh, um, most of you may have heard of this term, overfitting. What is overfitting? Overfitting is lack of generalization. You're, you're, very, um, you're very focused on a specific data set. You're only worried about that specific data set. Any different variation that is brought to you from uh, that is slightly here or slightly there, you don't do well. That is what overfitting is. And most people actually have heard of this term if they, uh, if they work on uh, uh, or they're learning machine learning uh, or predictive modeling. But not many people actually understand the ideas around generalization overfitting. And these are important concepts to know. Um, what else? Uh, we have. There is this idea of, uh, I mean, one might be tempted to say, yeah, I will uh, train the model and test on the same data. But uh, there is this practice of uh, training the data. Uh, I split the training data into partitioning, 80, 20, 70, 30, 50, 50. And then what you do is you train your data on uh, the 70%. And it doesn't have to be, right? So sometimes, I mean, people have, take it very like it's almost like uh, anything other than 70% and 70-30 is, it's, uh, it is not allowed, right? So, I mean, you can do 60-40, it is totally fine. You can do 50-50, that's also okay. Um, you can, uh, depending on what your situation is, you can use uh, any split there. But uh, the worry here is that this is not enough. There is this idea of a blind holdout data set, and the blind holdout data set is something that is set aside more than your test set. So you will actually create this 70-30 uh, uh, on this. And this data set is, uh, uh, I mean, in, in a, good, uh, a good practice would be is that this data set is locked away from you. you. If you are the one building this model, you have no access to this data set. And, uh, Essentially, it's almost like your future, da future data because that's what uh, your model is going to be tested on. So someone else is controlling this data. You are going to build your model on, uh, on this data set using the 70-30 split, and then someone else will just go and validate and then tell you how good is your model. Just like real life, right? So you get only one shot, one chance, whether you predict fraud correctly or you don't predict it correctly. You cannot just go and keep checking, yeah, am I correct? No, I mean, let's fix it. Am I correct? No, go, let's fix it, right? So it doesn't work that way. So even if you do 70-30 split, chances are that you might actually mess up. And that's why you have this, uh, the idea of a blind holdout data set. Okay, I talked about this. Um, I will only at high level talk about this, uh, this technique. Uh, we call it cross-validation. And cross-validation is actually a technique where you actually um, uh, split your data into, into 10, random, uh, 10 random partitions. And instead of training and testing it once, you train and test it 10 times over. And once you have, when you get, uh, do it 10 times over, and if now your model looks good every single time, that means you have come up with a good model because you're showing both uh, that, your, uh, that your performance of the model is good and on average, it is good, and it doesn't fluctuate a lot. So that's, uh, that's the whole idea about cross-validation. And uh, uh, what I would, uh, for those of you who are serious about uh, building machine learning models and you don't know uh, cross-validation, I would actually strongly, strongly recommend that you learn cross-validation as, uh, as soon as possible. Yes. If you're using a completely separate, uh, the blind holdout, you mean? One to 10 is my entire data set, and then I'm not using like a training and dev in a separate test set. Mm -hmm. um, if I do it this way, am I still at risk of overfitting? 
uh, if you do it this way, you ha uh, is there still a risk of overfitting? Right. Yes, but uh, you're minimizing the risk of overfitting. If you, um, uh, you will get some sort of statistical guarantee if you're uh, getting your estimate at, with a 95% uh, confidence, right? So um, one in 20 times you might mess up, but 95% of the time you will be okay. With many assumptions being there. There are a lot of assumptions that we make uh, around this. And once you do this, you're going to actually tweak your model. You are going to tweak your model uh, deeper tree, less deep tree, uh, higher penalty for model, low penalty for model, more trees, less trees. So you will twin, uh, tune your model, and you will tune it to the point that it gives you a consistently good, uh, consistently good results. And now there are other techniques uh, that can be used. As long as you create these random uh, uh, multiple models on random data sets, that is important. You have to randomize uh, and, and see if you model consistently on different random data sets. Uh, um, uh, it gives you a good train test uh, uh, um, error, and it doesn't fluctuate a lot. That is what you're looking for. Okay. Um, also, um, anything that can, uh, anything can uh, can change in data. Many things. I mean, data has uh, uh, maybe your business has changing. I, I've talked about this, right? So, uh, how do you ensure um, that your model is indeed good? You will actually go and run a controlled experiment on a small um, sample and gradually increase adoption. We call it the A/B testing or online experimentation. You are going to actually go and uh, 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 maybe try a on a 0.5% traffic or 1% traffic uh, if you're running an online service or maybe um, uh, on 1% customers or 2% customers to minimize the impact on your business. And once you have verified that this works, you will actually start increasing uh, the adoption and keep going. Okay, I think uh, that, uh, that is it. Uh, I will uh, stop here. I have skipped a few slides, uh, but in general, I think uh, most uh, has been covered. So. Any questions about anything? Yes. I don't have any experience using deep learning for any real scenarios. No. Um, and uh, so uh, I'm just curious, out of curiosity. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that is the perfect example of why Watson was on Facebook, because the deep learning techniques could actually identify those features. So I was just curious but uh, I mean, how, to what extent, right? So I, I, uh, I see that deep learning might be a good one for um, uh, images and uh, natural uh, languages, uh, speech and so on. But it's not, uh, uh, we should not look at this as a one size fits all. Uh, Right. But in certain domains, deep learning might be a good tool to use because it has the ability to actually generate all the, all the features, uh, generate uh, features on its own. But it may not be universally applicable uh, for across all the domains. As long as we understand the distinction, yes. I mean, it's fine. I was just curious on your yeah. yeah, I have not. Sorry. Yeah. I've actually used deep learning on real problems. And I found that, that it, it can very wildly, like you can have total divergence in one model mm -hmm. and false convergence in another and it, it's it's actually really hard to get people yeah. to work right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a real in a real problem. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's what my intuition is for a real world problem. Computer vision, I'm sure. Uh, or any image processing, anything that's uh, I wouldn't I shouldn't say that has a um, that doesn't have that wildly varying structure faces. Yeah, I mean, how many variations can a face have or object, human object, right? So did yeah. you just hear talk about CLF models using deep learning and the substance of it? So okay, great. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's, it's a great question, right? So, yeah. yeah. I'll give you one super simple example. Noise versus non-noise detection. Is this a human speaking or is this a dog barking? Mm -hmm. Change one neuron and the whole mm -hmm. model stopped working. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. In one, like, there was no way you could do a gradient. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, but there's, uh, there's hype and there's reality, right, so. 
Uh, and um, if you understand all of these best practices, I mean, no matter what machine learning algorithm you pick, it is going to be a decent model, right? So that's, uh, and that's why I, I think I never mentioned what machine learning algorithm we will be using, right? So it's all, it was everything but machine learning, if you put it. Uh, some people might say, where is the machine learning, right? So yeah, th this is what machine learning is. So which one will, be, will you use for Powerball? Uh, Powerball? Yeah. <laughs> I would not actually <laughs> even try to, right? If you knew what are your odds of winning, uh, then you would not play, actually. Yeah. Or maybe play and pray, right? I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, one column or yeah, the column mm -hmm. attributes maybe at a later date can be combined together, or maybe uh, by first This is again a feature engineering problem, right? So because maybe you you collapse them too soon, you uh, combine them into certain categories that they should you shouldn't have, or maybe you should have uh, grouped them to categories because individually there were way too many categories, right? So all of these things uh, uh, really. There is no silver bullet. I mean, you have to really try and fail and see whatever makes sense. This is, this is how you build good machine learning models, yes. Yeah, and In the uh, customer return prediction area, is there any resources that you point to for like case studies for good feature engineering and, and good models? Um, I, I, I will try to actually find something, and if I can find something, I will share. But uh, it will d it will depend upon your domain, though, right? So I mean, in, uh, say, if, take the example of a telco like Telenor, right? So what would be some of the features that can cause that can be factored in customer churn? Can you can you comment? Activity, age of the account. Okay. Age of the account, maybe uh, if it is up for renewal or not. Uh, uh, did they make any recent customer service call? Uh, did they make multiple customer service calls? What was the length of the call? And to you guys, what was the tone of the call? Does, did it look satisfied or not, right? So uh, really, I mean, if you look at it, um, I think uh, if you know the domain, uh, feature engineering, I think uh, if you think hard and you know the domain, I think you can do it. Yeah. And then the next step is turning those features into something. Yes, so basically, if, uh, you will, uh, if it, uh, what is the unit of prediction? You're predicting churn at the level of a customer. So you will represent each customer as a row in your data set. And uh, uh, each customer, maybe you know the age of the account. Um, so two years, right? So customer one field would be two. Uh, another one is uh, the median length of customer service calls. Maybe I'm making it up, right? The third one was uh, uh, maybe uh, how often uh, in the last week they have called. Uh, has uh, someone, um, how many has someone there who they call frequently, has, uh, has that number been uh, switched to a different uh, competitor or not? So you will create these columns for each of these customers, and then you will start uh, building your predictive model, whether they will churn or not. So that's how you'll do it. Uh, you might want to actually extract uh, features in a time, time series fashion, but this, is, this may not be actually a time series problem, per se. Time series is more for more continuous uh, changing data, yes. Which leads into my question. In your experience, <coughs> uh, to understand machine learning, what areas of mathematics do you need to know best? I mean, ideally, as much as you can. <laughs> well, uh, can practically, you <laughs> uh, practically, yeah. Uh, practically, uh, linear algebra uh, um, is important. But what, why? Uh, OK. Uh, because uh, a lot of it, a um, lot of regression modeling is, uh, revolves around linear algebra, uh, principal component analysis, and uh, dimensionality re reduction techniques, they revolve around algebra. So there's uh, probability and stats. Of course, I think that's a no brainer. I think most people understand that. And then beyond that, um, I would uh, go for calculus, of course. Uh, knowing calculus is important, optimization. So I mean, but, but do you need to know all of this? Uh, no. 
Uh, you can, uh, it depends upon what level of sophistication do you want, right? So to be an expert, an academic expert, you need to uh, know all of these inside out. But to be a practitioner, a little bit here and there, and that will actually serve the purpose. OK? OK, so I will still be here, but uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming over. And yeah, thanks.